Sorry. Um, I also would like to thank our colleagues at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin for uh, making available online images I will use, and um, also the Bach Archive Leipzig for the searchability that they've created for Bach sources. In my brief talk this morning, I will draw on examples from the textual evidence for Johann Sebastian Bach's compositions in order to complicate the notion of a musical work in the course of uh, yeah, of a musical work. In the course of this, I will touch on the deceptive quality of the printed edition that suggests a st textual stability that neither original editions nor recent scholarly editions can actually achieve. From the outset, I should observe that I am in agreement with Lydia Gere's scholarship that historically situates the emergence of the so-called musical work in about the year 1800. Bach, his contemporaries, and the historical predecessors, in my estimation, did not write what we now call musical works. The social and economic environment of the medieval and early modern eras necess necessitated music that functioned in a very different manner than music for the market economy that emerged over the course of the 18th century. Pre-1800 music was on the whole much more fluid and interchangeable than what became the norm in the 19th century. Surprisingly, because of the application to music of the text critical methods of philology, 19th and 20th century engagement with the music of Bach has resulted in still greater fluidity in the textual transmission of the composer's music. All this, I believe, has important implications for our approach to cataloging musical sources. So I will first discuss examples of Bach's parody practices that have often confounded efforts to establish a distinct textual identity for important compositions. I will then reference the small number of compositions printed during Bach's lifetime in editions prepared under his direct supervision. I will argue that these similarly demonstrate a textual permeability at odds with the normative logic of the work concept. I will then briefly touch on the relationship of thematic catalogs to work entities. Much can be said about the complications that parody presents in developing work records for a functional catalog of musical sources. Similar to other examples to be discussed later today, Johann Sebastian Bach's music offers plenty of instances of borrowing, usually self-borrowing, that would necessitate interlinking of work records to accurately detail the origins of compositions that possess distinct textual identities that are concretely documented in surviving sources. Emil Platten and Mariana Helms, in their critical report for the edition of, their edition of the Lutheran Masses, provide one of my favorite illustrations of the sometimes intricate web of reuse that Bach created. Beyond this, the B minor mass represents one of the most complex work entities in Bach's output. This entity is an assemblage of an even greater array of pre-existing materials than that found in the Lutheran masses or similar compilations, such as the Christmas Oratorio. As Joshua Rifkin has persuasively argued, only the Confiteor shows no sign of dependence on a previously existing source. In this case, in this context, it is wise to recall Friedrich Schmenn's emphasis on the disparate nature of the comp components that make up the B minor mass, or as he has it, später genannt, Messe in Hamel. While Schmenn's edition of the mass suffered from significant problems, subsequent scholarship has hardly resulted in editorial consensus. Since 1997, no fewer than four critical editions of the Mass and one of the early versions of key sections have appeared, including one prepared by our colleague Ulrich Leisinger. But the recent minor discontent about the Mass is really only an extension of the textual fluidity of this composition that has played out over 300 years. Indeed, one of Friedrich Schmenn's great accomplishments in the 1956 critical report to his edition of the Mass was to document the relationship of later manuscript copies of the Mass to their models, including the identification of the models used by Hans Georg Nageli for the first edition of the Mass and by Julius Rietz for his edition published by the Bach Gesellschaft in 1856. It should be noted that neither of these editions was based on Bach's autograph manuscript score. <clears throat> 
By contrast, the original printed editions of Bach's music prepared under the co composer's supervision might offer refuge for those seeking to affirm the operability of the work concept in Bach's output. In one example from Bach's printed editions, the failure to acknowledge the fundamental modularity of the disparate elements that make up the musical offering has led to a voluminous body of scholarship arguing for the authority of varying dispositions of the printed elements. Yet each element can stand on its own or be paired with other elements very satisfactorily. Thus, from a source cataloging perspective, is the musical offering more appropriately understood as a collection of two Rishikars, a trio sonata, and 10 distinct canons? Indeed, few surviving copies contain all five printing units of the original edition. More consequentially, the Klavier Übung, or as uh, Klavier Übung Fier, or as we English speakers call it, the Goldberg Variations, oh, hmm. um, could surely be held out as a tremendously coherent compositional entity comprised of a theme and 10 sequential groups of three variations that each culminate in a canonic treatment of variations on the baseline at successive intervals. Had Bach left it at that, this would be the example that might disprove my argument. However, in his personal copy of the printed edition, Bach continued to expand the collection with an additional 14 canons on the first eight notes of the aria's baseline, as seen on the far right. Bach rarely, under, Bach rarely stopped tinkering with his music, even after it was printed. I would argue that the modularity and textual fluidity that these examples demonstrate suggests that an operative work concept in the case of the music of J.S. Bach stands on a shaky foundation. This brings me to the question of thematic work catalogs. The deficiencies of Wolfgang Schmieder's Bach Werkefertzeichnis were such that Hans Joachim Schulze and Christoph Wolf began a new thematic catalog to disambiguate the various elements that had been grouped together under a single work title by Schmieder, who himself largely followed the example provided by the 19th century editors of the Bach Gesellschaft. For all the clarifications to the work entities that Schulze and Wolf provided, the Bach compendium was never completed, nor did its numbering scheme ever supplant Schmieder's BWV numbers. As a new Bach Werkefertzeichnis is in preparation, the work entities that form J.S. Bach's compositional legacy may be better elucidated. However, for all the clarity that such elucidation may bring to the sources and the compositional history that the sources document, the differentiation of distinct versions of a composition moves away from the ideal form that underlies the notion of the work concept. For example, there are two or more versions of the St. Matthew Passion, and four or more versions of the St. John Passion. A work level in rhythm that differentiates the 1725 version from the 1749 version of the St. John Passion would be musicologically sound. Indeed, the indispensable Bach Digital currently uses the Bach Compendium's approach to the delineation of works. One suspects that this would be the direction that will be taken in the revision of the Bach Werke Verzeichnis. Yet at the same time, there is very good logic for grouping all of the versions of the St. John Passion together under a single work record as seen in the Deutsche National Bibliothek's integrated authority file. Moreover, the surviving partially autographed score of the St. John Passion represents a fifth version of one of Bach's most renowned compositions. Indeed, it is in this version uh, which was never heard in Bach's lifetime, that is most familiar to audiences for over 150 years, having been enshrined in an early 19th century edition published by Troutwine, and then in the Bach Gesellschaft edition. Despite the fact that Arthur Mendel triumphantly disentangled the four versions of the Passion performed during Bach's lifetime, his edition of the St. John Passion for the Neue Bach Ausgabe also prioritized the unperformed version of the autographed manuscript. Only recently has an edition by Peter Volney presented editions of the two most complete versions that survive and Christoph Wolf's editions of the same versions are scheduled to be published soon. As I have noted, original sources often document 
more than one version of a composition. Disambiguating these versions is quite important, but in doing so, the potential arises. The relationship of one version to another will become lost. To avoid this dilemma, I would argue in favor of reversing the hierarchical relationship between work and manifestation. It is only in sources that works are embodied, even though few, if any, sources are entirely faithful embodiments of a work. This leads me to observe that the original logic of the Resume 2 series, with a focus on cataloging individual sources, remains quite sound. There is certainly a need to improve the quality and structure of work data in the RISM catalog, possibly in the form of a parallel tox taxonomy of work relationships. However, the point of departure for the RISM catalog needs to remain on focusing on distinctive source documents. I have a slide to skip, and I would say thank you. Thank you.